although um, you probably noticed that we had some technical difficulties, thank you for rejoining. Um, we're going to wait just another minute to allow um, participants to log back in, and then we will restart our webinar. webinar. Okay, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the session, Providing Psychological Services in the Face of Uncertainty, a question and answer series. I'm Dr. Jennifer Todd from the Office of Continuing Education in Psychology at the American Psychological Association. It is my pleasure to be moderating today's session. Our presenter today is Dr. Jeff Zimmerman. Dr. Zimmerman has been in independent practice since 1981. He was a founding and managing partner of a large multi-site group practice for 22 years before returning to solo practice. He is also a founder of the Practice Institute, co-author or co-editor of four books on practice and editor of Practice Innovations. Dr. Zimmerman is a frequent presenter and consultant helping mental health professionals build ethically responsible, thriving practices. He was the 2017 president of the Society for the Advancement of Psychotherapy. Prior to this session, we requested that questions be sent to us by email so that we could be sure that Dr. Zimmerman is able to address as many of your questions as possible during this short one hour session. I will note here that since we are starting a bit early, we will go a full hour. Um, and uh, so uh, we will plan to complete our webinar at about 2.15. There is also, in addition, a question box on the GoToMeeting platform if you would like to submit a question. We would kindly ask that you please use that question box to submit any additional questions based on Dr. Zimmerman's presentation. Please note that we will be holding two additional question and answer sessions over the next two Fridays in recognition that we may not be able to address all of the questions in our limited time on today's webinar. A quick housekeep housekeeping note, to be aware should our GoToMeeting platform go down at any time during today's webinar, again, we ask that you please wait 15 minutes and try to re-enter the webinar using the same link you used to gain access today. If we are not able to reestablish the webinar because of the stress to internet systems, we will post the webinar we are able to record and it will be available to you on our website. We will pick up the questions we were not able to answer during our next webinar next Friday. And so with that, let me thank Dr. Zimmerman in advance for being here and turn directly to our first question. Thank okay, you. so. Good to be here. Oh, thank you. With regard to best practices in providing service in, um, a, a virtual environment. Do you have any guidance for whether to allow clients to continue to choose to come to an on-site location if permitted in the city or state? And if so, do you have recommendations for documenting the client's decision to attend on-site and decline the option for teletherapy? Some decline telehealth because they don't have privacy in their home. Well, before I answer that and before we get started, I'd like to thank all our participants for staying with us in spite of the technical difficulties that uh, were happening on the on the platform. 
I'd also like to point out that I'm not an employee of APA and my comments don't represent APA official policy. However, shortly before this broadcast, I spoke with uh, Dr. Jared Skillings, Chief of Professional Practice at APA, and he offered to also be available to me and us, I guess, through, through me if there are additional questions or technical details that you need answered. So please send them to me and either I'll answer them or check in with Dr. Skillings will provide the answer or will direct you to where the answer can be found. In terms of the question, I would use great, great caution at this point about allowing a client to come into the office. You need to be attentive to the risks to yourself and your family and the risks of inadvertently exposing the client to illness. As I understand it, sometimes people who feel fine can nevertheless transmit the virus. Personally, I've decided to not see any patients in person until this passes. In terms of the documentation question, uh, you should always be documenting these and other kinds of conversations you have with the patients and their decisions. The privacy issue is challenging, both in terms of your residence, if you're making the uh, call or the video call from home, as well as the residence of the, uh, the client or patient. Um, I know there are some other questions coming up where we'll be talking about some specific ideas related to that. Thank you. We received lots of questions about issues around consent and HIPAA. So let me turn to a question related to that. One of the steps we need to accomplish to reach patients is to check in with them by email. But for many of us, if we collected patients' email addresses, we never got permission to communicate to the patient by email. Should we just send them a letter by U.S. Postal Service with a consent form so that they can then return it to us by mail, or they can email us giving us permission. People don't answer their phones, especially if they don't know the number they're being called from. If we leave a message and someone calls us back, how do we verify who they really are? Is it okay just to use their date of birth and address to verify? Well, personally, I'd be concerned about sending a letter to some patients uh, due to privacy concerns, and coupled along with that would be the length of time for them to get the letter and for me to get a response back, especially for the patients who are more symptomatic and possibly in crisis. I think it's a good idea to check your informed consent, see if it authorizes you to call the patient, and if so, I would then suggest placing a call and leaving your first, ten, your first name uh, not saying doctor. The patient who's been in treatment with you would, I hope, recognize your voice, and you could then say without giving too much information that you were just hoping to touch base, and then give them a way of reaching you. You don't have to even mention the patient's name if you're concerned that somebody else might hear the message. If it's a new case, then this is trickier. You might want to have a brief phone call and get permission to send them your usual forms to fill out. There are some digital applications, uh, some of which sign a HIPAA business associate agreement to allow you to send forms that can digitally be signed to, um, and the patients can then return them. Some of our patients may not have a printer to even be able to print out forms that you send them via email. Even in our office, many of us only take limited identifying information when seeing a client. So I'm not sure you have to go to you know, through great, great hoops to make sure you've got the person that you're you think you have, especially if they're a current client, you recognize their voice as well. Great, thank you. What tips or suggestions can you offer to help telephone or online sessions retain the benefits of effective communication and strong therapeutic relationships? I really was glad to see this question. Um, there are some practical ideas that I've been actually using myself and thinking about as well uh, and experimenting with. I think one, one thing we all can do is wear earphones and we can ask our clients to do the same. This at least uh, controls for half of the privacy in each environment. I think it's important to be sure to not multitask during the session, a habit which when you're on your computer may be hard to break. Um, it's good to only have the video chat on the screen and turn off all your notifications. Your eyes, your, your client will see your eyes move to check that notification that just popped up. 
and it's better for you to be looking in the camera. Along those lines, you can be certain to, you should, you should also check what's behind you uh, on camera, be dressed professionally, and avoid being in places uh, such as your bedroom, which while it may be comfortable, does not have the professional atmosphere you'd like it to have. It's also important to move the image of the patient to the top of your screen, so you're more likely looking towards the camera than down to one side. It's uh, amazing how when we're not looking in the camera, that is really obvious. You also can find it helpful to make sure you put your screen, especially if it's on a laptop or a phone or a cable, up higher on books so that it's elevated more at eye level rather than looking up at you from below. Great, thank you. If we are offering online drop-in support groups, for example, for healthcare providers, how do we handle consent and treatment within the jurisdiction of our license since we may not know the participants or even where they are from? Um, links seem to get shared across groups in need and don't always observe state lines. First, I check with your malpractice carrier. However, I'd also be very careful to think through whether you're just offering a place for people to get support as a public service and for no fee, or whether you're establishing a doctor-patient relationship. If you're establishing the latter, then you might need to first meet in, even virtually with participants and assess their appropriateness for the group, as well as provide informed consent, rather than have a drop-in group where all newcomers are welcome. Great. Um, now, this is a question I think has probably been on the minds of a lot of us. How do we help clients deal with the anxiety of the pandemic? I first take the risk of answering your question with a question. And I would ask, how do you do it in other circumstances? In other circumstances, it's often helpful to, to provide appropriate information or the sources of information. We don't all have to be and shouldn't be experts medically or um, in, in terms of the spread of this illness, but we can certainly give people sources of information. I think we can normalize the reaction. We can provide reasonable reassurance, and we can also discuss how they can have a sense of control. For example, we can focus on what they need to do to cope, how they may be able to uh, mitigate some of the physical, physiological activation they feel, and also strategies that they can use to increase resilience. Great, that's resilience, that's an important point, thank you. <clears throat> um, we got several questions about uh, conducting testing and evaluations. So the question, can I do assessment in a virtual environment? So here again, I can't represent APA's official position on this, but I'd be very hesitant to provide psychological testing in a virtual environment. This is especially true if you're going to try to use normative data rather than just descriptive data. And I'd be very concerned also about test security. On the other hand, you might be able to do virtual clinical interviews and interviews with parents if you're assessing children, as well as interviews with collateral sources. While there might also be a way to administer a paper and pencil inventory, I'd be concerned about test security. And on the other hand, some inventories, especially for adults, may be administered online by the vendor of the instrument but interactive assessments would be much harder to do in a way that meets standardization and administration protocols in a virtual environment, or for that matter, with masks and gloves on, in my opinion. Uh, by the way, some private payers are beginning to reimburse for testing via telehealth. You can check with your payers about that. Currently, Medicare doesn't, but the IOPC, the Internet Interorganizational Practice Committee, is developing resources regarding neuropsychological testing and telehealth. So more to follow on, on some of that. Great, and a follow on on that related to um, billing and insurance. Um, how do I bill insurance for telehealth? Uh, what, what are the things I need to know um, if I'm a practitioner moving to virtual environment? Uh, I can't speak for each insurance carrier, and there are, of course, many, 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 and across all states and provinces. I do understand that the federal government is recommending that you bill as you generally would in terms of diagnoses and CPT codes. 
However, you should indicate that the location is 02 or telehealth. Some insurance companies may require that you also include a modifier, 95 or GT, in addition to the CPT code. So verify with the payer because there's variability across the payers. But Medicare only requires the O2 POS or point of service modifier. O2, great. Um, a sort of related question. Um, will we meet requirements if patients waive their right to HIPAA compliance email? So if we offer that as the only option, might that seem like we are pressuring them? The problem is that people don't realize how cumbersome encrypted emails are with having to use passwords and codes. And when people receive these emails, as many of us have in the course of doing business, expect it or not, we often delete them because we think they're spam or phishing. Well, patients waive their rights to confidentiality in all kinds of situations. You certainly can check with your risk management company on this, but I think that a key issue here is that of informed consent. The patient needs to understand the limits of confidentiality and then can choose to authorize you to communicate in that way. I'm often struck by times when in, for example, small communities, patients will want there to be socially appropriate communication, like at a sports field, a place of worship, or a child's school, and they'll consequently authorize you to interact in those venues. You should consider what your policy will be about what information will be transmitted via email, discuss it with the patient, ask them to sign a form indicating they understand the risks and approve nevertheless. The idea here is you wanna make sure that you're getting informed consent, not just consent. Great, thank you. Um, we touched on this a little bit, but there was significant interest on this. So um, are there psychological assessments or psychoeducational assessments that are approved for administration using telehealth? Um, is it even appropriate to continue with evaluations when clients are in this unprecedented time? In the school setting, we have certain timelines in which evaluations must be completed. Therefore, we are out of compliance if we have not completed evaluations during this time when schools are closed. Are there any recommendations for how we proceed without coming out of compliance? So I think you have to do what's clinically appropriate. And while there's some ability to provide services in a modified way, like doing psychotherapy on a video platform, we can't bend to the point where we're making very important recommendations regarding a child or an adult without adequate data. There are plenty of timelines that are missed when schools and states are closed, and it, but it can be dangerous to insist on seeing patients in your office during this time like we were talking about at the outset. Also, varying greatly from standard assessment practice might make your conclusions very suspect, especially if you had to justify it in a educational arena or a legal arena or the combination of the two. You might be better off informing the school and the parents that given the crisis, you'll not be able to complete a thorough, thorough assessment in the time allotted and that you just will need to kind of stop the clock and then restart it again um, when we get it all clear here. Yeah, okay, I, I think that um, there's gonna be a lot of adjustments with regard to, to schools. So um, that's a great advice and I'm sure important advice. <clears throat> so um, two issues that make, um, that can make a practitioner cautious about moving to telehealth are number one, best practices generally require that you meet a client in person for the first time or have them check in with you at a clinic for their first um, visit with you. And two, is, te is telehealth appropriate for clients with moderate to severe problems? So it's, it's sort of a, a twofold question. Very good point. I was saying to a colleague yesterday that it's amazing how this crisis 
for some of us have caused us to really reevaluate our views. Three or four weeks ago, if a new client called me and said, Dr. Zimmerman, I would love to see you, um, but I can't come in and I would only want appointments over uh, a video platform, I would say, my policy is to only see you in the office and uh, you'll have to see somebody else because I won't do it that way. Blink my eyes and now it's three or four weeks later and if somebody called and said, Dr. Zimmerman, I need to see you in the office, I would say, I'm sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> And my policy is that it has to be on some type of internet video platform. I've completely done, at least during this crisis, a 180. Some people are saying maybe we should learn from this 180 and uh, perhaps broaden out our views of using some of this other technology. I think either way, we need to weigh the risks of not meeting the clients in person and yet trying to proceed into a doctor-patient relationship. For some people who may be very symptomatic, it would seem kind of inhumane to me to make them wait until this crisis is over. On the other hand, we do need to be careful to be practicing within our scope of expertise and also to make sure we're offering the appropriate level of treatment for the patient. One advantage during this time is that patients who are not working or having to commute to the office might be able to take the opportunity to have more frequent sessions. Remember, though, that you may need prior approval from the insurer if you're seeing a patient for extended sessions, like if you're sessions that are longer than usual or sessions that are more frequent than that insurer typically authorizes. Great, thank you. Um, we touched on testing and schools. Um, we got a couple of questions um, from the, the point of view of a student. So what is the best course of action for postdocs and trainees to take regarding providing both in-state and out-of-state telehealth services and working under a supervisor's license when states are vague about new directives under our current circumstances regarding COVID? I think a lot more supervision needs to be provided to the postdoc who is in the position of using a new medium to provide services when they're still early in their career. I would really hesitate to have postdocs provide services out of state or out of their area. In fact, I would suggest we should all hesitate to do that unless we're very aware of a few things. Firstly, we need to be aware of what that other state's current policies are for out-of-state providers and non-licensed individuals in supervision, which is a whole nother issue. Um, there are some states that are now allowing uh, limited short-term ability to provide services, even if you don't have a license in that state. But you do need to check with the state to know exactly what they're allowing and what you need to do to uh, sign up for that and to be approved if, if there's something you need to do. The other issue of non-licensed individuals in supervision uh, is also important because would that state allow that, respect that, or might they really consider the unlicensed person practicing without a license because they don't even have a license in the state they reside or in the state that you're, that you're providing the supervision? Uh, there are many places that are on state borders, and um, you could be living in one town and working in another and then speaking to, in one state, working in another state, and then speaking to a client in a third state that easily can happen, for example, in the tri-state New York area. And uh, each state may have different ways of dealing with this issue in general and uh, dealing with this issue now under these special circumstances. Uh, second is states will have different laws and regulations with regard to duty to report, uh, as an example. So you need to really know if you're practicing and providing services in another state, not only what your state's state requires, but what the home state of the patient uh, requires as well, because you could be doing something that is following the law in your state, and at the same time, that same action violates the law in another state. And you also third need to know what emergency and alternate services are available in distant areas. And I think whether that's across state lines or not. So if you're in a fairly large state, you may not know if you work in San Diego, you may not know all the services that are available in Northern California. Um, similarly, in many other states, once we go out of the area that we're most familiar with. And I think we have an obligation 
to know what emergency and alternate services are available in those distant areas in case the patient needs a more intensive intervention. So these elements become really important, not only to providing services in general, but when we're trying to uh, help a student or a trainee really build their skills. The other thing though that I'd like to say here is that we can use this challenge as an opportunity to help our students and interns and postdocs really get a sense of how we can not only help the client cope and be resilient, but how we can do that too in the face of a crisis or an emergency. They'll likely face their own that we can't even predict, just like we couldn't predict this crisis, that we can't predict over the next 40 or more years of their career. And this could be a great learning experience in terms of how an organization, whether it's a small clinic or a small practice, all the way up to a very large hospital and treatment facility, of how we deal with and help those that we treat deal with these crises and what kinds of self-care we also engage in to make sure that we're resilient, that we're safe, and that we're able to provide the services as best as we can. Great, thank you. Um, we got a lot of questions related to informed consent, and this is sort of a, a you know, new frontier with regard to uh, telehealth and informed consent. So how do we get or informed consent from clients can we do verbal consent to do phone therapy and just write it in the notes? Or what do we need to have in writing in terms of uh, a written consent form while we're still um, being in compliance? So first of all, what's been adjusted is not the information that's protected under HIPAA, but rather the current HIPAA enforcement criteria for the federal Medicare and Medicaid programs and possibly the commercially insured by extension or by state mandate. But really it's the enforcement criteria for the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Having said that, I believe it's essential to notify patients of the risks around telehealth and what you've done to mitigate those risks. For example, signing up with a video platform company that offers a business associate agreement. I'm not sure it matters much whether you make this an addendum to your informed consent document or a separate document. And in some cases, you might just chart it in the file. As I was saying earlier, for example, when a patient's unable to manage the technology required to send the form back to you, or they can't leave their residence to mail something back to you, or they don't have a printer or, or what have you. Whether seeing teenagers or adults or seeing couples or running groups, the same demands are on us in terms of consent for treatment. And as I was saying earlier, I also wanna underscore that informed consent is not just about getting forms signed. I can't begin to say how many of our colleagues uh, will, will get a request for information that's signed and see that as they now have informed consent. The form sign is consent, but it's really, our duty is also about the informed part, not just the consent. I think we need to pay special attention to our discussions about what the process entails, the risks to privacy. For example, if, if we use a video platform right now under this crisis without a business associate agreement, some will provide it, some will provide it for a lot more money a month and some won't provide it at all and what we will do to try to offer the best services we can under these unique and trying conditions. Then the client can determine if that's okay with them or if it's not okay with them. We absolutely should have that documented in the file. If it can be signed, all the better. But there are cases even in, in kind of regular everyday practice outside of this current situation um, where we are going to um, have to use judgment and also have to think about what's best for the, the patient. Um, and there are times that we will document informed consent uh, and then wait till the patient comes in and have them sign something. For example, a patient calls you from their doctor's office and asks you to speak with their doctor about medication 
and uh, the doctor wants to know your treatment plan and your diagnosis and is thinking of giving them a certain medication and wants to check in with you first, not to get a medical opinion, but just to find out what's happening either in terms of your assessment and or your treatment of the patient. You have the doctor on the phone, you have the patient there, and the patient is having some pretty acute symptoms, but not suicidal. Might, once you have the verbal release, you chart that in the chart and then expect to have the written release signed the next time you see the patient in normal circumstances. Or would you say to the patient and the doctor, I can't talk to you until two weeks from now when I see the patient. Many people would not do the latter because they don't want to interfere with the care the patient is getting. But it's, it is really using good judgment about best practices and standard of care and uh, making sure that you are documenting and documenting your reasoning in case uh, it doesn't uh, go well in some respect. Um, and there, so you, there may be times where you can't, you just can't, especially in this circumstance, um, get a signed release on a piece of paper. If that same doctor were to call now and were to say, um, I spoke to Mary or Marty Jones on the phone, and I'm thinking of uh, providing uh, some medication for them, and Marty or Mary Jones, the patient has called you and said, my doctor's gonna be calling, but you still don't have a signed piece of paper, and you might not have that signed piece of paper for weeks and weeks and weeks, you're really in a quandary about, do you just chart that the patient called and is verbally authorized release? Maybe they sent you an email if you are accepting emails that way, um, that would be more have more clinical information than just an appointment. But they haven't really signed your release form. So you're really left with a question about, how do I weigh this grit, what I think is a kind of gray situation? And some others may say it's not for one reason or another, but how do I weigh the different factors here? But certainly you want to document what you did and why you did it so that it's clear if it's ever going to get reviewed later. Great, thank you. There's a follow-up question we got in the question box related to this. Um, you mentioned digital applications that allow clients to sign consent forms digitally. Are you able to offer the name of any programs that they that might be able to research? And do you know if these are HIPAA compliant? So I can I give you some um, ideas here. I, I will preface it by saying I don't have uh, knowingly, unless it's in a mutual fund someplace, whatever that's worth today. But I don't knowingly uh, own any stock in any of these um, companies. So I'm not recommending a company that I have a, a vested interest in in any way um, that I know. The, the, and then I'll also talk about a do-it-yourself methodology um, as well. So you can look up a company called DocuSign. Uh, that's one of them. And um, there's another one called Sign Now. And um, you could probably also go on a search engine and type alternatives to DocuSign and Sign Now and see what, what comes up in terms of electronic signing or uh, applications and companies that provide that service. The problem with a lot of them is that they want you to be what they call an enterprise account, where they're looking to sign a hospital um, or some other large organization in order to provide that business associate agreement. From my personal standpoint, the business associate agreement is a Word doc, and they're in a sense whole holding that uh, unless you uh, buy an expensive uh, subscription to their services. I was talking to two of them this past week, and one wanted $6,000 and one wanted $4,000. And of course, that is um, prohibitive for most of us. However, you also can speak with them, explain the situation, and one of them has offered me a three-month 
trial subscription at no charge, but hasn't yet provided the business associate agreement that they told me they would provide. Um, and when the trial agreement came through, it was for one month. <laughs> so I'm not sure that's going to work out. And I'm a little hesitant yeah. to give, give out uh, specific names. I'll tell you another do-it-yourself approach, which clearly your risk management consultant might be a little concerned about, but I'm also thinking about the way of providing the best care we can under these uh, topsy-turvy emergency circumstances. So another approach is to either use a um, encrypted email, some of them, they, the encrypted ones will sign a business associate agreement. I think hush mail may be one of them. And they also may have the ability to send documents back and forth and even get electronic signature. You'll have to check on that. Another option, the do-it-yourself option I was thinking about, um, there are um, your electronic health record company, if you use an external company, or if you use a file uh, server such as G Suite, Google Suite, G Suite, or um, Microsoft Office, they also have their free applications, but they also have uh, servers where they will tell you that those are of higher security, there's data redundancy, things like that, in case the server in one part of the country uh, burns down, that building burns down, or there's an earthquake, your data is mirrored and are, are mirrored in other places. And there you might be able to create a document which you could then send to the client if, especially if the client has given you permission to do that and recognizes that it might not be fully confidential. But you know, I have a, this is again, my own thoughts about this, that even sitting with a client in your own office may not be fully confidential because somebody might be able to hear through the wall or through the door and see the client come in and go out. And there are all kinds of more complex discussions we can have about that. But clients can waive their confidentiality. And a client can say to you, I understand about the difficulty in sending me forms um, at this point, but I do want to get started. I give you permission to send me the forms. Send me the forms to this hopefully personal address, or if it's a work address, one that they're still authorizing you to use. And um, I'd like to get started. I think we're in a very unusual time right now. And if we don't use good judgment, we could wind up with the unintended consequence of people uh, getting literally hurt or dying because we were not giving them access to care. So we have to balance the access to care with appropriate and thoughtful and mindful following of our ethical guidelines, which are guidelines. And uh, of course, our attention to uh, not only federal regulations, but as I said earlier, the um, regulations in our own state or jurisdiction. Great, thank you. Lots, lots to unpack there. And yes. keeping in mind also that it's an ever-changing landscape. So um, I really appreciate that. So we got also several questions about how to best provide virtual therapeutic services with children. And if you have any suggestion about best practices. Well, one thing I want to want to say before answering that question, I'm sitting here you, because we're not doing video, you can't see me smiling. But it's just <laughs> wonderful to see the breadth of questions that we're getting, you know, from adults to, to children to testing to ethics to HIPAA to billing. We uh, are just getting a wonderful breadth of, of questions, and um, that's that's great, and it, and it makes me smile. Um, but providing services to kids can be tricky. But some, even the young children, some are used to communicating with grandparents and parents, for example, who are working and are divorced. Some are used to communicating to them via video. Uh, my own grandchildren um, communicate with me. One, I'm in New York and two are in California. And 
there's often video at a very early age of one sort or another. So it may not be as unusual to them as it feels to some of us, especially those of us who may be older and didn't grow up on it. On the other hand, we might have to keep our sessions short. We might need to engage the parents in helping share an activity with a child, which we might not need to do if we were in the office. And we might have to do some research in advance to find activities where we can, like we're doing here, uh, share our screen in order to interact with the child. Uh, quick aside, my granddaughter and I and, and uh, Grampy and Nana went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art with her the other day virtually. They had a wonderful uh, children's uh, platform and we shared a screen with her and she took notes and drew her own pictures representing the artwork that she saw. And while we weren't doing any type of play therapy, we were engaging with her in a very open and free way as if we were walking through the museum. And it occurred to me that that could also happen here too. If you think about what kind of work you're doing with this young child and then see if in some way you can find an app or a website that will allow you to share that activity with the child, um, you, you may be able to continue to have a good connection, even though it's different than when it's in the office. And that, again, apropos of the, the last question I perhaps was a little long-winded on, that allows you to continue the therapeutic relationship which may be better than fracturing it because of the crisis. Great, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so um, a, a lot of providers are kind of um, grappling with this new reality and had to change gears really very quickly um, and abruptly uh, to figure out how to provide services um, virtually from home, telehealth, whatever. Um, do, do you have video conferencing platforms that you would suggest or that are HIPAA compliant? Like, can, is it okay to use Skype or what are, what are the things that you suggest um, for providers that are trying to get up to speed in this new reality? So I often hear and see online that this service is HIPAA compliant, whatever, whether it's a video service or an email or a document signing service or something like that. But really, in my opinion, we're the people who need to assure HIPAA compliance. And in order to do as the provider, and in order to do so, the organizations that we work with, they have, and, and if they have access to protected health information, they need to sign a business associate agreement to legally agree to maintain confidentiality. This is still in effect. However, as I said earlier, there's a temporary relaxation on the enforcement of this by the federal government for Medicare and Medicaid. Remember, as we were talking about earlier, this doesn't mean that your state is doing the same thing, so you need to be careful about making sure you know your state guidelines and that you're following what's mandated. You certainly can look at platforms like, um, like Zoom. Um, I do think that their video conferencing, unless they've made a shift recently because of the crisis, their video conferencing is a lot more expensive than their usual um, monthly single person um, subscription. Go to meeting, um, we'll sign a HIPAA agreement. I think they're a little less expensive. The G Suite applications, they use Hangouts and a version of Hangouts called Meet. And G Suite, um, I believe, will sign a HIPAA agreement. I have one of them. And so will Microsoft Office. You have to make sure you're in the right plan and that you actually physically get that agreement, it'll be sent to you by a PDF and that it's been signed and that you sign it um, so that you have that agreement. And um, I believe, I'm not sure about Office, but I think there's a, a 
teams or some other kind of um, application that they have in their suite of applications that allows for video conferencing. The G Suite does. Uh, I think there's also one called VC, the letter V and then SEE, -E, and another one called Doxy. I will say, as you've all noticed on this call today, that right now, and as uh, Dr. Todd mentioned, right now the platforms are being inundated because we have um, so many people, for example, on this call, um, and we have so many people out of work and on multiple calls at the same time that I think sometimes the servers can't handle it. Yesterday, I know that Zoom had an issue, GoToMeeting had an issue, and my conference line had an issue, um, where at different times of the day, uh, there were problems that just I noticed on those three different platforms. So uh, we're in this kind of gray zone now where things aren't exactly working right. And uh, I'm actually personally using two platforms because if one doesn't work, I have the other as a backup, which I've already had to use yesterday. And then I also have the conference line if I need, if need be um, as well. So yeah, unfortunately, we have, yeah, we, we've experienced our technical difficulties ourselves today, but um, that's a good idea to have um, have a backup plan, have, try out a platform and have a black backup platform just in case. Um, and you can, you so, can tell the, the yeah. client that, um, you know, by email in advance, it says, look, if you have a problem, call my cell phone, or if you have a problem, try this other link to the video platform. To another video platform. Yeah, great idea. Um, we got many questions about um, intake or first contact and how best to make that first contact or to do intake um, virtually. Um, should, um, should, is it best to schedule a certain time but add extra time in case of technical difficulty or issues getting the platform up, um, things like that. What is the best way you suggest to conduct an intake via telehealth? So first, since we can't really bring somebody into our office as one of the earlier questions suggested, and I know in New York, you know, we're all housebound as we are in many other places around the country. Um, I would first have a short call with the potential patient to discuss their reason for seeking treatment and how we're going to handle this first session and how we handle getting forms signed and all of that and to make sure that that's okay with them. Um, and I would document that call. I do think it's advisable to allow extra time for the technical issues. Um, I'm glad that we all did that on this call. So we are, we're now running over our allotted stop time. And uh, because technical issues are going to come up in these next weeks or months until this, this crisis passes. Um, some of these can be minimized if you're very familiar with the technology you're using so you can help direct the client. So you may use a platform that they have no familiarity with. And in this regard, uh, if you're more familiar, familiar with it, you can even send them a customized instruction sheet rather than the large PDF that the platform provides. You can practice with your family members or a friend to help you learn the ins and outs. So you can say to them, you know, your, your mic is muted. The little mic app um, icon is in the lower left-hand corner or the lower right-hand corner. You need to click there and then do this and then do that. Um, so the more familiar you are with it, the best, the better. I'd also explain to the client on the initial screening call that the first appointment you'll be doing as a consultation. I do that routinely with new clients, regardless of this crisis, because I wanna see if there's a good fit. And in this particular case, at, during the time we're in now, you'd wanna see if this medium actually works for the client and how they feel about continuing to use this modality of telehealth. Some who aren't in acute distress may say, you know what, I'm gonna wait until this crisis passes. I appreciate the first appointment, which you can charge for, but I, and you tell them that in advance, but I appreciate the first appointment, but I really didn't like it, and I wanna wait until the crisis uh, passes. 
But if the patient's in acute distress or there is a risk of injury in this modality, just like in an office appointment, um, waiting might not be appropriate. And uh, we have to make sure that uh, responsibility, uh, that we take the responsibility to make sure that the medium that we're using is appropriate. So in the office, a client who comes in for that first appointment but really needs a more intensive level of care, you're not going to continue working with them. You're going to hopefully refer them to uh, a day treatment or a partial or a hospitalization program or what have you. Or if they're in the wrong place, they need a substance abuse treatment program, um, but they came in for depression, but they really, you, you discover that there's substance abuse and there needs to, that needs to be treated first in your opinion, then you're going to make sure that they get the treatment they need. And likewise, I think especially given the potential discomfort for telehealth, we need to take that first appointment and make that a consultation so that the patient understands we're gonna see how that goes um, and, and then decide what to do from there. Great, I think we have quite uh, time for about one more question. Um, and this is a, a very practical question. Um, can you speak to the practical and ethical considerations of modifying treatment approaches for use with teletherapy? Specifically, do you have thoughts on making adaptations for treatment of PTSD and other trauma-related disorders for delivery via teletherapy? This is a, a question I've actually been giving a lot of thought to, and I don't have, unfortunately, a single clear answer, but I can say that there are clients where I think we need to slow down and we may need to modify and really decrease the pace of what we're doing with the client. There are other clients and treatment modalities where we may be able to modify some of the in-office work and do that via telehealth where clients can either do it on their own or with our guidance around, for example, some various anxiety management strategies. Uh, some of us may use some type of meditation induction or self-hypnosis induction or some other anxiety management induction. And we may make recordings for clients in, in session and they can still use those. Surprisingly to me, or maybe not for some of our listeners, there are other clients especially perhaps clients who've been traumatized, who find the distance, the physical distance of not being in the office, but being able to see you, they might actually find that easier and safer in some respects and be able to do more work with you with that distance. It's the same as a PTSD client who has a, a therapy, uh, usually a dog with them, and that dog's function is to keep distance between that person and somebody else in the community. So the dog is always kind of standing in front of your patient. Um, and here we create that distance with the telehealth. So there may be some people that you're going to find benefit from it. I think the, the important thing is to really be assessing, it's not a one size fits all, and it's assessing what works best for this client. Does it work best to change my office hours, by the way? Does it work best to see somebody at seven o'clock in the morning or at eight o'clock at night because that's when their partner's there to take care of the kids or that's when the kids are asleep and they can have the privacy and you can perhaps have the privacy as well. Like I was saying earlier with the earphones on, does that, that gives you a greater sense of privacy and whether it's with anxiety disorders or any of your clients, it's really assessing what's gonna work best with this client and how can I do it in an ethically responsible way and a way that also follows uh, local, state, federal statutes, especially during this time of crisis. Great, thank you. Those are some really interesting and important points. So that is all the time we have for questions today. On behalf of the Office of Continuing Education at the American Psychological Association, we thank you for joining us today. 
We also would like to thank Dr. Zimmerman for sharing so generously his time and expertise and patience with our technical difficulties. As a reminder, we will be, <laughs> um, we hung in there. Um, as a reminder, we will be offering uh, question and answer webinars with Dr. Zimmerman next Friday and the following Friday, April 3rd and April 10th as well. We're being very greedy with Dr. Zimmerman's time. <laughs> so re regist <laughs> registration for both of these sessions opens the Monday prior to the Friday session. We would also like to direct you to some resources which APA is happy to make available related to telehealth and general pandemic resources. Links to these resources are listed here and all can be found on the APA website at apa.org. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining.